be able to describe the anatomy of the pleura, okay, the different types of pleura that you have, the uh, um, various subdivisions of it, okay, and also the lungs as well. Um, I don't expect you to go into the bronchopulmonary segments. I think it's um, to just go across. Um, Stretching the shell. I think somebody <laughs> has uh, YouTube. Sorry, your microphone on. Thank you. Okay, and then um, we'll be also talking about the lymphatic lymphatic drainage as well. And lastly, would be the clinical conditions that go along with the anatomy of the lungs and pleura. Okay, so we start with the thoracic cavity. As you all know, the thoracic cavity can be divided into three compartments. You have the central compartment, which we've actually talked about um, in previous lecture, cardiovascular system, which is the, which was the mediastinum part of the thoracic cavity. And then the lateral two compartments that is mostly filled by the mainly going to be occupied by the lungs would be the 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 lateral compartment of the thoracic cavity. Okay, so uh, the lungs obviously does not occur by itself. Okay, it needs to have structures that uh, provide it with innovation, with um, blood, uh, and also to cover it. Okay, so that's why the pleura is there. And these two left and right lateral compartments are com completely separate from each other. So basically, it's completely separated by the mediastinum. Okay, now we're going into the pleura um, specifically. So uh, before we go into the pleura, um, the, the pleura has two layers, okay, the parietal and visceral pleura. Uh, but the parietal pleura, which is the outer layer, it does not come in contact with your uh, chest wall, okay, the anterior posterior chest wall. Uh, what you have dividing uh, between the pleura and the chest wall is this um, fibro areola layer. So it's called the endothoracic fascia. This endothoracic fascia it lines the internal aspect of the uh, chest wall. So it divides, um, it separates the parietal pleura from the chest wall and it allows uh, you to have this division where it's easy for you to separate um, the, the, the lungs and the pleura with it from the chest wall. So if you were to do any surgical um, uh, approach Doctor, you're muted, doctor. Someone muted me. Thank you very much for that. I did not mute myself. Someone muted me. Um, uh, if you don't want to listen to the lecture, it's fine. Just, you know, please don't mute me. Um, okay, so the plural can be divided into two. Okay, uh, you have the parietal plura and the visual plura as any... Um, uh, thing that as any uh, lining of your viscera, you have these two layers. Okay, later when you look into the abdominal cavity, also you have like a parietal peritoneum and a visceral peritoneum. Okay, but here in this um, uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk about pleura itself. So pleura is like a a um, you can see that you have this like balloon. Okay, so when you have this balloon, um, the viscera okay will in that invaginate into the balloon, okay? So when this is, say, the lungs, all right, it will invaginate into the pleura. So now you have these two layers that covers the lungs. Okay? You have the one on the outside, and then you are on the inside. And in between these two layers, you have a little cavity. Obviously, it's not going to be as inflated or as big or as significant as the balloon, the cavity of the balloon, uh, but you still have some space in that, and that's your pleural cavity. Okay, so you can see if the the lungs is collapsed, the pleural cavity is quite significant. But in 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 normal um, human beings, again, the, the lungs will be expanded. So you only have a slight little cavity. It's not even as big as this. It's very very little, just for fl pleural fluid to be in there to reduce friction. Okay, so on the outside here is the um, parietal pleura. Okay. Uh, this is the parietal pleura on the outside, and it can be divided into different um, uh, subdivisions depending on which part of the lung that it covers. And then on the inside here, this is the 
uh, visceral pleura. So the visceral pleura is very much closely related to the lung parenchyma. Okay, uh, you have like fishes, you have the the um, uh, division of the lungs, the visceral pleura will invaginate, will, will go very intimately related to the lung parenchyma. Okay, so these are serous membranes. Okay, um, we'll be looking at it clearly. Okay, and then at the at this region here, okay, at this region here, at the root of the lung, okay, this is called the um, hilum or the root of the lung, they will come together, okay? It's continuous between the visceral and parietal, right? And what it does is that it forms this cuff, okay? It's like a little sleeve around the root of the lung. So this is called the pleural cuff around the root of the lung. And you can see inferiorly, um, it actually hangs down a little bit to form a double layer of parietal pleura. And this here specific place here is called the pulmonary ligament, okay? So you have the pleural cuff, uh, surrounding the root of the lung, and then inferior to that, you have it hanging down, but it's still quite closely related to each other, and this is called the pulmonary ligament. Okay, so between the between, as I mentioned, between the visceral and parietal pleura, you have a little space here. You can see we have um, uh, this picture here that you can zoom in. Just a little tiny space here, and in here you have your pleural fluid. So you don't have a lot. The whole amount of pleural fluid is about 10 to 20 mil for the whole entire pleural cavity. So you can imagine that it's quite closely related, but still separated by the pleural fluid. And pleural fluid allows the um, parietal and visceral pleura to move on one each other, on one on each other. Okay. So it reduces friction. And if you were to look at this picture here, okay, on the outside here will be the uh, parietal pleura, and on the inside here will be the visceral pleura. And you can see the visceral pleura will follow along all the fissures that you have in your uh, lungs. Okay, it's very, very closely related to the lung parenchyma. All right, and the different parts of the uh, parietal pleura, it, again, it, uh, you can name it according to the region that it covers. Okay, so you have four, uh, uh, parts of the parietal pleura itself. Okay, on the top here, where it covers the apex of the lung, this here is called the cervical pleura. Okay, so it actually extends above the superior thoracic aperture into the root of the neck and it forms this cup like shaped dome over the apex of the lung. So it covers just the top part. The cervical pleura is not uh, massive, it just covers the, the apex of the lung. And then uh, the one colored in blue here, which has been peeled off, all right? This is your costal pleura. It covers wherever you find the ribs, okay? Uh, that's where you find your costal pleura. So costal pleura, it uh, lines the internal surface of the thoracic wall, the, of your chest wall or the thoracic cage. Okay, that's your costal pleura. Because costal pleura is quite, uh, uh, I think the most significant part of the uh, parietal. And then on the inside, the colored in this orange, orange red color, this is your mediastinal pleura, because you can see that it is related to the mediastinum. Okay, and inferiorly covering the, uh, separating the lungs from the diaphragm, that's the diaphragmatic pleura. Okay, so it covers the superior surface of the diaphragm or the diaphragmatic surface of the uh, lungs, all right? Again, your parietal pleura can be divided into four. You have the cervical, covered color in yellow, the costal, color in blue, and then the midline here would be the um, mediastinal in red, and you have the diaphragmatic pleura covered in, uh, uh, colored in green. Okay. So the parietal pleura uh, has a uh, lines of reflection. So where it covers the lungs, it will it will go from one. Uh, plane to the other. Okay, you have three separate lines of reflection. Okay, so three lines of reflection. Number one would be the sternal line. Okay, so sternal line by its name, you can imagine that it will be near the sternum. So this happens when the costal pleura, the one covered in blue, becomes the mediastinal pleura. So when it it turns this way. Okay, when your Pleura turns that way. This is called the sternal lines of reflection. And this sternal, this sternal line of reflection on the parietal pleura is very sharp. Okay. Um, this area here is quite a sharp 
reflection line. All right, the second uh, line of reflection is called the costal line. Okay, so costal line happens here inferiorly. So this happens when the costal pleura turns to become the diaphragmatic pleura. Okay, so in that region here. This also is a very sharp turn. So this one, as I mentioned, is called the costal uh, line. And then finally, um, on the posterior aspect, you find the vertebral line. Vertebral line. So you can see vertebral line becomes when the um, mediastinal becomes with the costal, but it, it's on the posterior aspect. Okay, so if you were to see this picture here on the posterior part here, where the uh, mediastinal be the midline becomes the costal, where it turns that way. Okay, this one here is the vertebral line, and the vertebral line is rounded. All right, it's not as sharp as the uh, sternal, nor is it as sharp as the costal. So again, uh, this picture here shows you uh, this here would be the sternal. Okay, this is the sternal line where the costal becomes a mediastinum, mediastinal pleura uh, anteriorly. And this here would be the costal line where the costal pleura becomes the uh, continuous with the diaphragmatic pleura. Okay, and posteriorly, you will find the, um, what do you call that? The vertebral line here. I'll just color it in green. Sorry, in purple. So the vertebral line is when the costal becomes the, uh, sorry, the mediastinum becomes the costal posteriorly. All right. Any questions with the lines of reflection? Excuse me. Okay, sorry. Um, all right. So during expiration, right? Um, because your your uh, uh, parietal pleura is bigger than your visceral pleura. Okay. So uh, during expiration, the lungs does not completely fill the the pleural cavity. So you have this potential pleural spaces, uh, and this is the costal diaphragmatic recess and the costal mediastinal recess. So you can see in this region here, on the outside, this is called the costal diaphragmatic recess. Okay. So this is the lungs. The lungs does not go all the way. Um, it does not reach as far in theory as your vital pleura. So you have this little potential space, all right? So costal diaphragmatic recess on the lateral part. And on the midline here, you have the costal mediastinal recess. And this is important because it's the lowest um, part in your uh, uh, pleural space, okay? So if you have like any pleural effusion, uh, this is where the uh, fluid will accumulate, okay? Because it's gravity dependent. So if you um, stand up, this is where you have all this uh, fluid that will um, fill in the spaces, okay? Right. So diaphragmatic recesses is quite important. Also diaphragmatic and costomedestinal recesses is uh, important clinically. Right now we're going to the surface anatomy of the pleura, specifically the parietal pleura, because the visceral pleura will just basically follow the surface anatomy of the lungs, because it's very closely related to the lungs. So if you want to talk about the visceral pleura, it's going to be the surface anatomy of the lungs, basically. But if you want to talk about the parietal pleura, because remember parietal pleura is is it covers a wider area than the lung itself. It um it takes up a wider part of the thoracic cavity. Okay, so we start with the right side here. Okay, uh, and then most superior part it begins at the apex, about two centimeters above the middle third of the clavicle. So this here will be, if you we just continue here, would be the clavicle, right? The medial third of the clavicle, just two centimeters above this middle part is where the apex will start, and then it will continue towards the midline. Okay, uh, it will go behind the sternoclavicular joint. Okay, where the clavicle meets the sternum, right? And we'll go all the way to the midline behind the sternal angle. So at the sternal angle, it will reach the midline, okay? Remember where the sternal angle is, is where you have your trachea bifurcating into the bronchus, okay? 
So you need the lungs to be very closely related to the area. Okay, so therefore your parietal pleura that covers it also needs to go very near the midline. Obviously, it doesn't go, go all the way right in the smack dab in the middle here, but it will approach the midline at the sternal angle, behind the sternal angle. Okay, uh, so behind the sternal angle here, it will continue downwards, straight down, all the way to the ZP sternal joint, okay, where the body of the sternum meets the xiphoid process, right? And at the ZP sternal joint here, it will turn towards the lateral side. You will turn towards the lateral side, and this is uh, around the level of the sixth costal cartilage. Okay, it will turn to the left side and it will, it will turn laterally, sorry, it will turn laterally and will take an oblique route all the way down. And this one we will, we will um, cover it later. Now we're going to look at the left side. Okay, again, it's the same thing, begins two centimeters above the middle third of the clavicle. Will continue all the way to the uh, go behind the sternoclavicular joint and it will reach the midline at sternal angle. So, in this aspect, okay, in this aspect, both the left and right lung are the same, okay, but for the left lung, it's slightly different uh, in this region here because you want to uh, accommodate for the heart, okay. So, the parietal pleura will continue straight down from the sternal angle all the way to about the fourth costal cartilage. Okay, at the fourth costal cartilage, it will turn laterally to the lateral margin of the body of sternum. So you can imagine the body of sternum is there. Okay, so it will turn laterally at the um, fourth costal cartilage to the lateral margin of the sternum. And then at the sixth costal cartilage is where it will take the oblique uh, route downwards. Right, so you have to remember this region here because it's it differs from the right and left parietal pleura. For the right parietal pleura, it goes straight from the sternal, uh, behind the sternal angle, it will straight go straight down up to the ZP sternal joint, and then it will go turn laterally at the sixth costal cartilage. But for the left side, it will go from the sternal angle to the fourth costal cartilage, turn laterally to the border of the sternum, and then only it will go down and turn laterally at the sixth costal cartilage. Okay, so from this point here, from this point of the sixth costal cartilage, it will take this oblique route where at the eighth costal cartilage, it will pass the mid clavicular line. Okay, so we withdraw the clavicle here. There's a mid clavicular line here where it will pass the eighth costal cartilage. And then um, uh, the 10th the tenth rib, it will reach a 10th rib at the mid axillary line. So mid axillary line, um, you, it's better to see from the uh, don't have a picture there. from the side. Okay, it's right. It will cross the axilla. This here is the axilla, so you should know the anterior uh, axillary fold, the mid axillary line, and posterior axillary fold. So at the tenth, um, sorry, at the mid axillary line is where it will meet the tenth rib, and then lastly, posteriorly here, it will just be at the lateral part of the twelfth thoracic vertebra and the posterior side. So the 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 root, the diagonal root downwards, it will go meet all these um, landmarks, okay? So again, six costal cartilage is where it will turn laterally. It will cross the mid-clavicular mid line at the eighth rib, and it will cross the mid axillary line at the twelfth rib, and, sorry, at the tenth rib, and it will just be adjacent to the thoracic vertebra at the twelfth rib, okay? That is your parietal pleura. So for left and right, it's just the same. Is it, it the left and right parietal pleura differs only when it has to accommodate the lungs, uh, sorry, the heart, which is where your the fourth costal cartilage, uh, it will turn laterally at the fourth costal cartilage. Okay, any question about the um, surface anatomy of the uh, parietal pleura? All okay? This is everyone is all right with that. Now we're going to look at the uh, neurovascular supply of the parietal pleura. Okay, so the parietal pleura is going to be supplied by the body wall arteries. Okay, so you have the intercostal, especially, is quite important. And this intercostal is going to be supplied by the internal thoracic artery. Okay, you have some musculophrenic, spirophrenic arteries that also supplies the um, parietal pleura. So it, it derives its arterial supply from uh, various uh, systemic. Uh, the arteries that supply your uh, chest wall. Okay, it's the same with the with the venous drainage. We'll go into the uh, veins that drains the chest wall. Okay, and uh, for the lymphatics, it will also join the uh, the uh, lymph that 
drains the body wall as well. Okay, but it's important to know that the cervical pleura is going to be uh, drained by the axillary nodes. So axillary nodes will be in the axilla, the axillary region. All right, uh, for the innervation, so the parietal pleura being uh, a lot of it will be, uh, you know, it's very, being very closely related to the chest wall. It's very sensitive to pain, temperature, touch. Okay, This is not something that you find with your uh, visceral pleura. So the parietal pleura can sense nociception. Okay? It can sense um, even, you know, uh, temperature differences. Okay, And this innovation, it uh, depends on which part of the parietal pleura that we're talking about. Okay, so the uh, costal pleura, along with the cervical pleura, uh, is going to be innervated by the intercostal nerves. Okay, so in the intercostal nerve that supplies the chest wall will also innervate your costal pleura here. Okay, the mediastinal pleura in the midline, all right, in the midline is very closely related to the heart, remember, to the middle mediastinum. Okay, so this mediastinal pleura and a little bit of the uh, diaphragmatic pleura, the central part of the diaphragmatic pleura, will be innervated by the phrenic nerve. Remember, the phrenic nerve will be lateral to the heart, okay, in the middle pericardium here, because it has to go to supply the diaphragm. C3, C4, C5 keeps the diaphragm alive, okay. So the mediastinal pleura, along with the central part of the diaphragmatic pleura, is going to be innervated by the phrenic nerve, okay, and then the peripheral part of the diaphragmatic pleura here is going to be innervated by the intercostal nerves as well, but it's going to be the lower six intercostal nerves because it's on the lower part. So all of this um, innovation, it uh, it gives you a different um, a kind of referred pain, especially. Okay, later we'll be talking about that. So you know the parietal pleura is sensitive to pain, temperature, and touch, and is innervated by different nerves depending on the parts of the parietal pleura that we're talking about. Okay, the visceral pleura itself is not sensitive to pain. It's not sensitive to touch. But what it's sensitive to is to stretch. Okay, this is different. Touch and stretch is different. The touch is just like a, uh, if you put pressure, a pinpoint pressure, you can feel that. But stretch, you need to be able to um, expand the lung or, or um, uh, you know, expire, inspire to be able to stretch your visceral pleura. Okay, and the nerve supply for visceral pleura is from autonomic nerve supply. So it has a little bit of the vagus nerve, which provides parasympathetic parasympathetic nerve supply, and also from the sympathetic plexus, okay, from the thoracic chain of, um, of uh, uh, sympathetic uh, nervous system. Okay, and together, this uh, vagus plus sympathetic plexus, it forms what is known as pulmonary plexus. Okay? So whenever you talk about the lungs as pulmonary, it's very quite easy to relate it together. Uh, for the arterial and venous drainage is going to be by the bronchial arteries and veins, and the lymphatics is going to be very closely related to the lung lymphatics, right? So parietal pleura is more of the chest wall, whatever supplies the chest wall, be it artery, veins, lymph, or nerve. But for the visceral pleura is whatever supplies the uh, lungs. So again, bronchial, bronchial arteries, bronchial veins, whatever lymphatics that drains the lung and also the autonomic nerve supply, which is from the pulmonary plexus. Okay, um, uh, a few clinical queries for the pleura. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, the pleural space is a potential space. Usually it's very, very closely related to each other. Uh, only about 15 to 20 mil of parietal fluid is located in the pleural space. But sometimes if you have any pathological um, problems arising, you can have what is known as pneumothorax, where you have it filled with air, you can fill with fluid, as I mentioned earlier, by pleural effusion. Okay, if you have um, blood, it's called hemothorax, and you have pus, it's called empyema. Okay, or chylothorax is also what it's called. Okay, and this, um, especially if it's fluid, it can be drained by placing uh, a needle uh, in this pleural space. Okay, and I'm pretty sure you've talked about where you need to put the needle earlier when you talk about the thoracic cage. So usually you put it in the upper border of the lower rib because inferior border of lower rib, uh, sorry, inferior border of the ribs, you find your neurovascular bundle. Okay, so you need to put just slightly above the upper border of the rib so you can avoid the main neurovascular bundle. Okay, and for pleural fusion, that um, uh, it will be the gravity dependent, so it will a lot of it will be located at the 
uh, costal diaphragmatic recesses. So if you look at the chest X-ray, you have blunting of the costal diaphragmatic recesses. Okay. What is blunting means is that usually you can see that the costal diaphragmatic recess is quite sharp at the side of the X-ray, but when you have fluid, right, it will cover it, and you have this instead of being sharp like this, it will be blunt in an X-ray because fluid is radio opaque. Okay, it's not radio lucent. All right, I'm sure you've talked about this when you talked about your heart failure, uh, congestive cardiac failure, last BBL. All right, okay, uh, as I mentioned, you can have neuromothorax where you have where the uh, uh, pleura has been penetrated, okay? So when the pleura has been penetrated, air from the outside will go inside into the pleural space because your uh, interthoracic pressure is lower than the atmospheric pressure. So because of the difference in pressure, the Atmosphere, the atmospheric air will go into the pleural space. And when you have a lot of air in the pleural space, it will actually compress the lung and you can have what is known as a lung collapse. Okay, this, this is like a tension kind of pneumothorax. And then with um, if you have any uh, penetrating wound, be it from a bullet, a stab wound, or even a fractured rib can cause this. And if you have this kind of problem, you can also have uh, blood that can enter the pleural cavity and that will result in hemothorax. Okay, and one more thing is the referred pain. So remember your parietal pleura has different kinds of innervation depending on the part of the parietal pleura we're talking about. So costal pleura, where it's being innervated by your intercostal nerves, okay, it will be referred to the chest, okay, because that's where the intercostal nerves go to supply. And then the uh, per peripheral part of the direct pleura, it was also innervated by the intercostal nerve, but more for the lower intercostal nerve. It will be referred to the anterior abdominal wall. And for the mediastinum or the central part of diaphragmatic pleura, it's been innervated by the phrenic nerve. It will actually go to the lower part of the neck and over the shoulder. Okay, because this is your phrenic nerve distribution. All right. Uh, one more thing is um, pleural rub. Okay, so remember you have your pleural fluid that fills the pleural space. Okay. So the pleural space divides between the visceral and the parietal pleura. So if you have uh, a problem uh, like inflammation of the pleura, it, it makes the surface of your pleura rough. And when you breathe in and out, you can actually hear a rub. And this is called the pleural rub. Okay, you can also call it pleurisy. Inflammation of pleura is called pleurisy. So this pleural rub occurs uh, when you have this inflammation and it's not going to be a smooth movement between the visceral and parietal pleura, so you get pleural rub. Okay, I think that's the end of the parietal, uh, sorry, that's the end of the pleura, that we're going to go into lungs. Any question thus far? The pleural rub sound is heard upon auscultation, is it, Doctor? Sorry? The pleural rub sound you're referring to is heard upon auscultation, is it? Yes, it's, been, it's going to be heard upon auscultation. Uh, because usually on auscultation you don't hear any any move any uh, sound coming from the movement of the parietal to on the visceral pleura. You can only hear the breath sounds or any pathological that happens in the lung itself. Uh, but in here you can actually hear the rub going to be um, uh, dulling all the sounds in the lung. So yes, it's heard upon auscultation. Any other questions? No. Okay. All right, so we're moving on with the lungs. All right, so lungs, you know, it's an organ of respiration. It's actually quite light, okay? It has a lot of uh, air pockets in it, so it makes it very light and very spongy, okay? It's actually even uh, less dense than water, so it'll float in water, and it will crepitate when squeezed. So you can hear the, it will crepitate, it's like um, when you take something filled with air and you, you can hear the, the air just, escaping little little by little okay sort of like if you were to like take a bubble wrap and do like crunch it up uh, that's what propitate sounds like okay um so the shape of it is it looks like half a cone okay, if you put a left and right together then it looks like a kind of like a full cone and as mentioned earlier the apex is going to be projecting outside of the thoracic cavity it's going to go above actually the um thoracic inlet or the superior thoracic aperture and it's going to be covered by the cervical pleura. 
Okay, so you can see uh, this is the lungs. You have three surfaces, okay, on the outside here. The whole thing is called the costal surface, okay. This whole entire part is being covered by the costal pleura, is a costal surface. In the midline here, this is your mediastinal surface, okay, going to be covered by the mediastinal pleura. And inferiorly here, this is known as your diaphragmatic surface, okay. The diaphragmatic surface is going to be uh, resting on the diaphragm, all right? And this is going to be covered by your diaphragmatic pleura. And above here, we call it the apex, okay? So as it has three surfaces, it also has three borders. So anteriorly, okay, this here is the anterior border, okay? All of this here is called the anterior border. You can see it's quite a sharp border. Hence, the sternal line of reflection is sharp as well because it follows the sharp border of the lung. All right. Inferior border, okay, this is all your inferior border. Also sharp, okay, your costal uh, lines of reflection here is also sharp, right? And lastly would be the posterior border here. So posterior border is broad and rounded, all right? So broad and rounded. So that's why your vertebral um, lines of reflection is also um, blunt, okay? Right, and on the uh, um, anterior border of your left lung, you can see that it actually will uh, have produced this notch here. This is called a cardiac notch. This is to accommodate for the uh, heart that's going to be projecting to the left side of the thoracic cavity. All right, so the right lung, uh, it differs a little bit from the left lung, okay, apart from the cardiac notch that you have here. You also have three lobes to the left, to the right lung. You have a superior lobe, you have a middle lobe, and you have an inferior lobe. Whereas for the left lung, you only have two lobes, okay? So you only have a superior lobe and an inferior lobe. You do not have um, uh, a middle lobe for the left lung, all right? And then for the fissures, okay, so if we just do look at this first, okay, uh, on the right side, you have two fissures. You have a horizontal fissure and you have an oblique fissure. On the left side, you only have one fissure, just the oblique fissure. That's why, because you only have one fissure on the left side, you have only two lobes. But when you divide the lung with two fissures, you have three lobes on the right side, okay? So the fissures will, um, from the posterior part, okay, it will go from the, uh, level of your thoracic vertebra 2, okay? So from the posterior, it's quite high up for the oblique fissure, right? So it will go all the way down in a diagonal manner. So if you look at the posterior part of the lung, okay, slightly uh, the superior part, there's a small superior part is going to be made up of the superior lobe, right? But most of the inferior part here will be made up of the inferior lobe. So a significant portion, if you were to look from the posterior uh, surface of your lung, you can see a lot of it is going to be made up of the um, inferior lobe. Okay. So for the right lung, you also have another fissure. Remember the horizontal fissure. So this here is your horizontal fissure. Okay. So horizontal fissure is going from the uh, obliquely along from the fourth rib to the fourth uh, costal cartilage anteriorly. Okay. So that's your oblique fissure, um, this is, sorry. Okay, that's your oblique fissure. This is your horizontal fissure, okay? So oblique fissure, oblique fissure, and that's the horizontal fissure. So superior lobe, uh, inferior lobe, and middle lobe. Middle lobe is very slight, okay? You can only see from the anterior side. And then for the left lung, that's your whole superior lobe. And this here will be the inferior lobe. Okay. For the left lung, you also have a specific portion of the lung here, in this region here. This is called the lingula. Okay. The lingula, it looks like, why is it called a lingula? Because it looks like a tongue. Okay. It projects slightly to the inferior part of the, of the heart. So you have a slight... Um, uh, projection here. This is called the lingula and it will uh, lie between the cardiac notch and the oblique fissure. So cardiac notch, oblique fissure, in between these two, you have the lingula. The right lung, three lobes, left lung, two lobes, right lung, three fissures, left lung, only two fissures. Okay, now we're going to look at the root of the lung. 
So the root of the lung is going to be formed by structures that enter or exit the lung at the hilum. Okay, so this region of the lung here is called the root of the lung. It will connect the medial surface of the lung to the heart and trachea because you need the blood vessels to move in and out of the heart okay, to provide root for blood to go in and out for oxygenation. And then also uh, the bronchus needs to go in and out uh, to go from the trachea into the lungs. Right? So structures that form the root of the lung, you have the principal bronchus. Right? You have the... Um, so you have the principal bronchus, and then you have the pulmonary vessels, right? It's usually you have one artery and two veins, okay? And also the bronchial vessels. So these are smaller vessels that you can see in the root of the lung, as well as um, nerves as well. So the branches of vagus and sympathetic trunk. So this is called the pulmonary plexus. Remember, the pulmonary plexus will innervate your visceral pleura, okay? So it is sensitive to stretch. Now we're going to look specifically, specifically at the right lung root, okay? So right lung root, you can see, um, okay, you can see that this here, is here will be the bronchus, okay? So the upper part, you have the bronchus. And actually, the uh, uh, bronchus, you can actually see two because the uh, bronchus, the primary bronchus divides early. Okay, so you can see a, uh, a superior part and an inferior part. Okay, and then you have the pulmonary vein. Pulmonary vein will occur inferiorly. All right, and then um, in between the bronchus and the vein, you find your pulmonary arteries. Okay, for the left side, okay, for the left side of the lung, the, the su most superior part will be your pulmonary artery. Okay, most superior part will be pulmonary artery and the inferior parts will be your veins. And in between this will be the bronchus. So it's slightly differ from each other. For the right side, you have the superior um, part will be bronchus, inferior part will be the uh, veins, and then in between that, you'll find your artery. Uh, for the left side, superior artery, inferior vein, in between will be the bronchus. Okay? Any question so far before we move to impressions? No questions so far. Okay, so impressions are the um, uh, structures because in the thoracic cavity, everything is quite packed very closely to each other. So when you have this uh, structure very like very densely in, uh, against each other, you will form impression on the root of the lung, on the surface, the mediastinal media surface of the lungs, okay? Um, because lungs, again, they're quite soft, so it, it's easy to leave imprints on it, right? So for the right lung, this here is the right lung. How do you know it's the right lung? You can see the anterior part here, it's sharp. This part here is... Um, uh, uh, what do you call it, blunted, and then the root is, has to be in the midline, of course. So anterior, posterior, okay? So uh, what you see first is you see uh, this here, okay, as a groove for your brachiocephalic vein. And from the groove for the brachiocephalic vein, you have your superior vena cava, okay? So brachiocephalic vein will drain into the superior vena cava here. And here you find the cardiac notch. Okay, you find the, sorry, the cardiac impression. So superior vena cava will drain into the heart, right? Heart here, right? If you trace it upwards, okay, if you trace it distally, you find that the superior vena cava there, which obviously drains into the heart. And from the superior vena cava, you find that the um, brachiocephalic vein will drain into the superior vena cava. Okay, and then you see this uh, light, arch here, a smaller arch, it's not the aorta, but you can see that it's actually connected to the superior vena cava and it forms like um, uh, an arch above the root of the lung. And this here is for the azygous vein, okay? So that's the groove for azygous vein, All right? Posterior to that, you find the groove for the esophagus. So directly posterior to the root of the right lung, you find a groove for the esophagus. Okay, right. Any questions? No questions. All okay. All right. Um, I think it's fine to just know the, the important 
um, impressions because these are the ones that you can actually see in models in 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 gross model, right? Uh, for the left side, let's find the left side here. Okay, so for the left side, what do you have? is the main one obviously would be the cardiac impression okay where the uh, heart sits all right and then you find that you have this deep impression here above them okay this here is the arch of aorta impression okay so for the right side an arch that forms above the root of the lung is the azygous vein for the left side an arch that forms above the arch the root of the lung is the arch of aorta. And because the aorta is obviously a more significant vessel, we find that it's, it forms this deeper and wider and more significant uh, um, arch above it, okay? So you have this uh, groove for arch of aorta and posterior to, the, posterior to the root of the lung, you find the groove for the descending thoracic aorta. So for the right side, you also have a, a structure posterior to the root of the lung, which is the esophagus. But for the left side, it's the descending thoracic aorta. Okay. And sometimes you can see a superior to the arch of aorta. You have another groove here. This is for the subclavian artery. All right. I think those are the important, one, important ones that you can actually see. Okay. Now we move on to the uh, surface anatomy of the lung, right? Okay, let's have a look at the picture. Okay, so just now we've done the surface anatomy of the parietal pleura. Now we're going to see the surface anatomy of the lungs. So we begin with the apex, right? So the apex will form a convex shape upward. Okay, again, it will project above the superior thoracic aperture. Okay, so from the sternoclavicular joint, they will form a, a, a dome-like shape 2.5 centimeters above the medial third of the clavicle. So from the sternoclavicular joint here, they'll form the, uh, um, what do you call that, dome-like shape upwards. Okay, and then the lung will continue the sternoclavicular joint here. It will go all the way to the sternal angle. Okay, it will be slightly just um, uh, lateral to the line of the parietal pleura. Okay, and from the uh, sternal angle, we will continue all the way down to the thick costal cartilage. Okay, so the beginning part here is very similar between the lung and the parietal pleura. Okay, so uh, above the middle third of the uh, clavicle, and then it will pass behind the sternal clavicle joint and will go to the uh, behind the uh, sternal angle. Okay, from the sternal angle, uh, it will go all the way down inferiorly, straight down a vertical line to the sixth costal cartilage. And from the sixth costal costal cartilage, will extend. So from the sixth costal cartilage, where does it go? It will go to the sixth rib in a mid clavicular line and eighth rib in the mid axillary line. So for the parietal pleura, it was eighth rib in mid axillary and 10th rib, sorry, eighth rib in mid clavicular, 10th rib in mid axillary. But for the lung, it's sixth rib at the mid clavicular and eighth rib at the mid axillary. So you just minus two from the parietal or you plus two from the lung itself. Okay, and posteriorly, let's see, posteriorly it's, going to be at the 10th rib or 10th um, uh, vertebral column, okay? The 10th uh, thoracic vertebra. So for, pri for parietal pleura, it's 12. For the lung, it's the number 10, okay? For the left side, it's slightly different, again, because you need to uh, adjust or you need to accommodate for the heart, right? So it will go down from the sternal angle, it will go down to the midline, to the fourth costal cartilage, and then it will form the cardiac notch, okay, it will turn laterally, and it will go to the sixth costal cartilage before it turns in the midline, okay, it will go turn laterally. All right. So it's the same with the parietal pleura as well. Parietal pleura also will uh, turn to the left, with the uh, fourth, and it will straight down, but it will be more nearer to the medial side. 
Okay, for the lumps, it will take a more lateral approach. Right. But what's important is you know that it go from the sternal angle to the fourth, and then to the sixth costal cartilage will turn to the left, and then the mid clavicular line it's at the sixth um rib, and the mid axillary line will be at the eighth rib, and posteriorly it will be at the tenth rib, just adjacent to the vertebral column. For the parietal pura, you will have to plus two. Okay, so mid clavicular eighth rib, mid axillary tenth rib, and then the uh, adjacent to vertebral column will be at the 12th rib. Okay, so you have this two rib difference between uh, the parietal pleura and the lung surface anatomy. Any questions about that? Okay, no questions. All right, so there are some differences between the right and left lung. Um, usually the right lung is a little bit heavier but shorter. Okay, remember um, your your right diaphragm, right hemi diaphragm sits slightly more superior because of the presence of the liver on the right side. So the right lung is slightly shorter, but because it's shorter, it's actually um, a little wider in, 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 in diameter than the left lung. All right, so there are certain uh, differences, okay? So you know that uh, the lobes are obviously different, okay? You have three um the lobes are different from the left and right. So you have three lobes on the right side and two lobes on the left side. Um, and the fissures also, you only have one fissure on the left side, but two fissures on the right side. And uh, difference in bronchopulmonary segment. I mean, again, I would not touch on the bronchopulmonary segments because it will be a little bit complicated to entangle. And I think at your level, it should be fine to just know the gross parts first. Okay, um, the blood supply, so the bronchi, um, uh, the connective tissue, and the visceral pleura are supplied by the bronchial arteries. Okay, uh, so bronchial arteries here are the uh, branches of your descending aorta. Remember, um, the visceral pleura is also supplied by the bronchial arteries. Okay, and the bronchial veins will also drain here these um, structures and it will drain into the azygous and hemiazygous vein. All right, and then the nerves, okay, so the nerves is going to be limited by the pulmonary plexus. So this will have the same kind of innovation as your visceral pleura. So pulmonary plexus is um, autonomic nerve, okay? So it has to have sympathetic and parasympathetic. So parasympathetic is going to be from the vagus. Someone's mic is open, someone's mic is open switch on okay so the sympathetic uh, is from the sympathetic trunk okay so from the uh, chain of sympathetic uh, thoracic sympathetic nerve and then the parasympathetic is going to be a contribution from the vagus nerve okay so you have to know that uh, different kinds of innovation produces different kinds of uh, effect effect in the uh, lungs so for the sympathetic fibers okay that uh, is the efferent fibers that, that supplies the lungs uh, and also the bronchioles. Uh, it produces bronchodilation and vasoconstriction, whereas parasympathetic will be the opposite. So parasympathetic will bronchoconstriction, vasodilation, and we have a lot of glandular secretion as well. So parasympathetic is not good for somebody who has, um, you know, things like asthma. Okay, so they need more of a sympathetic kind of stimulation to help with uh, your lung diseases. Okay. Alrighty. So this is a. Uh, all right. So you can see here. This here is this en entangled mass of things here. Is your pulmonary plexus. So you have your pulmonary plexus on the right here. Pulmonary plexus on the left. Again, pulmonary plexus. You're gonna um, derive your autonomic uh, innovation. So sympathetic is from your uh, thoracic chain here, right? So sympathetic nerves is going to be given off of this chain to go into your pulmonary plexus, okay? And also from the vagus, um, you're going to give off branches also towards to contribute to the pulmonary plexus. And this will go into the, uh, to innovate the lungs, the lung parenchyma as well as the visceral um, uh, pleura. Okay, now an important 
quite important part of this um, uh, lecture is the lymph drainage, especially when you want to talk about, um, uh, uh, you know, especially lung carcinoma. They see that how the um, uh, lymph from the lung can spread. Okay, so lymph from the lung, all of this, your lung parenchyma here will, will have um, lymph going into the lymphatic channels. Okay, so lymph from the lungs here, it can either go in a superficial route or a, um, a more of um, a, a deep route. Okay, so deep plexuses, if you go into the deep route, you'll go into all these deep plexuses of um, lymph nodes. Okay, so this will be around uh, the bronchi or just around the peri. Uh, peribronchial tissue, but what it does is eventually it will go to the uh, pulmonary nodes. Okay, so pulmonary nodes here, you can see, okay, it is labeled here. These are all your pulmonary roots. Okay, all of this is all your pulmonary nodes. So if you go, if the lung parenchyma, if the lymphatic drainage from the lung parenchyma go into the deep root, it will go to all these um, pulmonary nodes or the lobar bronchi. And from the pulmonary nodes, it will drain into what is known as the hilar lymph nodes. Okay, so hilar lymph nodes here are this one here at the hilum, okay, at the root of the lung. Why is it the root of the lung? Because you can see the bronchus coming in. Okay, so these are all your hilar lymph nodes. So from your uh, pulmonary nodes, you will go into the hilar nodes. Hyla nodes will be around the hilum. So from the hilum, hyla nodes, right, you'll go into what is known as a tracheal bronchial nodes, right? So tracheal bronchial is where the trachea becomes the bronchus. So these are your tracheal bronchial nodes, okay? Tracheal bronchial, you have um, a superior bron tracheal bronchial as well as an inferior tracheal bronchial. This here is your inferior tracheal bronchial because it happens inferiorly. Right, where the trachea becomes the bronchus, tracheobronchial. Okay, sometimes you also call it the carinal node. Okay, because that's where your carina is. Right, and this here is your superior tracheobronchial nodes. Okay, so from pulmonary to the hyla, okay, to the tracheobronchial, either superior or inferior tracheobronchial nodes. Right, so from this tracheobronchial nodes, it can go two ways. Okay, on the right side, Okay, it will go in the right bronchomediastinal lymph nodes. So this here will be the bronchomediastinal lymph nodes. Okay, uh, and then it will drain into the bronchomediastinal trunk. Okay, this here is your bronchomediastinal trunk. And then it will drain into the right lymphatic duct. Right lymphatic duct. Okay, so from bronchomediastinal trunk into the right lymphatic duct. No, right lymphatic duct. Okay. On the left side, okay, from the superior um, uh, tracheobronchial nodes, it will actually drain into this part here. Wait, let me find this here. This here is called the left bronchomediastinal trunk. So you have a right bronchomediastinal trunk, you have a left bronchomediastinal trunk, and from the left bronchomediastinal trunk, it will drain into the thoracic duct. Okay, so that's how the lymph is brought back into the circulation. So again, from the parenchyma, right, it will drain into the, um, uh, what do you call that, the pulmonary nodes. Okay, these are all your pulmonary nodes. And that will drain into the hyla nodes. Okay, hyla nodes is also known as your bronchopulmonary nodes. And that will drain into your tracheobronchial nodes, either superior or inferior. And from the tracheobronchial nodes, it will drain into the mediastinal nodes. Okay, and that will drain to on the right side into the right bronchomediastinal trunk, and from the right side as well, from the right bronchomediastinal trunk, will drain to the right thoracic, sorry, right lymphatic duct. Okay, on the left side from the superior inferior tracheobronchial uh, nodes, okay, it will drain into the left bronchomediastinal trunk, which will drain into the thoracic duct. Okay, all of this you can see in this picture here. Okay, in this diagram here. So you can try to commit that into memory and try to see the corresponding um, lymph nodes in the picture. So then you can make sense of it. Okay, so eventually it needs to go back into the blood circulation. Okay, for the clinical correlates, so you have what is known as the triangle of auscultation. Okay, 
Um, so if you want to auscultate the lungs, obviously uh, you have to do it from anterior and posterior to ensure that you cover a lot of the uh, uh, lungs. Make sure you cover the whole of the lung. So if you can remember that your lungs, if you look for it from, your stina, from um, uh, the middle view, okay? So if this is posterior, this is anterior. And the oblique fissure actually goes from all the way from here to there, okay? So if you auscultate from anterior, okay, it's easy for you to get the superior lobes, okay? But if you auscultate from posterior, it's easier for you to auscultate the inferior lobes. So if you auscultate both uh, from anterior and posterior, it ensures that you can listen to the whole entire lungs more efficiently and um, you cover all your bases. Okay, so inferior lobe can be listened at the triangle of auscultation here. Okay, triangle of auscultation here, you can listen to it quite directly because you don't have a lot of, you don't have any muscles or any bones that would cover the uh, area here. Okay, so it's between your scapula, your trapezius, and your lat dorsi. So this is a triangle of auscultation for you to listen to the inferior lobe as clearly as possible. Okay. Other than that, um, never forget to uh, auscultate the apex of the lung. So apex of the lung, you know that it projects above the superior thoracic aperture. So you can actually listen to it above the clavicle. Okay. So this is how you would um, assess or you would auscultate a patient. Okay. You just have to remember the sites. And I think in clinical skills, you can also be able to um, do that. Um, and another kind of correlate for you to know is uh, Pankos tumor. So Pankos tumor occurs um, when you have a cancer of the apex, non-small cell lung uh, carcinoma of the apex. Um, and because apex goes all the way above the uh, thoracic aperture, superior thoracic aperture, it can compress the sympathetic ganglion at that at a at quite a high level and when you do that you produce a lot of these uh, signs and symptoms okay so a lot of the sympathetic um uh, uh, uh sorry uh, sympathetic innovation can be um compromised so you have partial ptosis okay meiosis and hydrosis and also you have loss of, loss of celiospinal reflex so this occurs in patients with tumor that uh, at the apex okay so uh, partial ptosis means that you can see the the um, eyelid is drooping. Okay, meiosis you have this pinpoint um, uh, pupil. Okay, you can see that the pupil is uh, smaller on the left side as opposed to the right side. And hydrosis you don't have any sweating that occurs on on the left side of the face. And then you have the stylospinal reflex, which I think you can um, learn when you do nervous system later. All right, any question on the lungs? I think it's worth to just go, uh, if you, I hope all of you have an anatomy book and to just look through the bronchopulmonary segments. Just, you don't have to memorize anything, but just to give you a picture of how the lungs can be further divided um, into different kinds of segments, depending on the, on the, they call it bronchopulmonary because you have a uh, you know, primary bronchus and then you have your secondary and tertiary. So all of this will supply a section of the lung. So it can be divided into um, the bronchus that supplies the lung. Okay, so you call it bronchopulmonary segments. All right, any questions? No, is everyone still here? Maybe not. Well, say la vie. Uh, yes, please. Okay, only Jonathan is here. I'm still here also, Doctor. We are all here. Doctor. Uh, doctor, I have a question. Hello. Doctor, you're muted. Don't mute me again. Yes, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, um, the, regarding the surface anatomy, what about the surface anatomy for the middle lobe of the right lung well, middle lobe of the right lung yes all right so uh let's see so middle lobe is quite uh small um 
Sorry. Okay. So middle note uh, of the right lung, uh, you can only uh, access the right, the middle lobe through the anterior part of the, uh, what you call that, to the anterior part of the chest wall. Okay. So um, for the middle lobe, what happens with the horizontal fissure is that um, it follows the fourth uh, rib. Sorry, the sixth, I think. Okay, just below the, the fourth rib is where, if you were to look at the horizontal fissure again, I think the horizontal fissure was the fourth rib. Uh, let me just go back to horizontal fissure. So it will go along the fourth rib um, uh, along the, the, the right side of the lung, okay? Um, the fourth rib here, okay? So this is where the fissure, uh, horizontal fissure is, all right? I want to just go back to that fissure section. Okay, so horizontal fissure. Horizontal fissure, it will follow along the fourth rib uh, to the fourth fossa cartilage anteriorly. So anything below, okay, so that's your, that's the uh, horizontal fissure. Anything below the fourth fossa cartilage would be the inferior, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, would be the middle lobe of your right lung. Okay, so posterior is easier for you to listen either in the mid axillary line or to the uh, from the posterior side. Okay, uh, middle lobe for the right lung. Okay, would be uh, below the fourth costal cartilage. Okay, and also therefore the fourth rib as well. So below that would be your fourth, uh, your middle lobe. Anything above that would be your uh, superior lobe. So that's how you can auscultate. Uh, for the middle loop. Does that answer your question, Jonathan? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, so you need to know where the dividing fissure is and anything above that would be superior, anything below that would be middle loop. All right. Any other questions? No question? All right. Uh, then I will see you on Friday, is it? Let's see, Friday. I don't know. Uh, MO3, 2.30 today, yeah? MO3, anybody from MO3? Yes, I do. Okay, doctor. Okay. All right, okay, that's it then. So I'm very proud uh, to my brother. Uh, doctor, too. attendance, attendance. Yeah, attendance. Already said this now. Find that right, I already sent it in the chat. Okay. Okay, is that all? And yes, then I will give you your slides. Thank you, Doctor. All right, so I'm like, bye. Thank you, Doctor.